Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and today on Sword and Sandal Cinema, I'm proud to bring you The Many Faces of Hercules with Brian Walker of Brian's Drive-In Theater. Greetings and welcome, Brian. Always a pleasure to see you. It is great to see you, Hercules. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing phenomenally well, keep, keeping very busy and opportunities are coming back to, to teach and do enrichment and to lecture. So uh, I'm enjoying uh, uh, this time of uh, lots of fruitfulness in that area in life. Well, you know, and I'm happy to hear that. I, I think that you can be um, you know, vital and useful and um, you can find your part in society at any age. I don't think that's you know, necessarily the domain of the young. I think, I, I think we all ought to you know, strive for that really. So good on you. I'm really excited to be learning more about Gordon Scott, one of the sons of Hercules and uh, one of the Hercules. <laughs> and one of my favorite actors to tell you the truth. I've been watching his films you know, since childhood. Um, and he was the first uh, Tarzan to be in a color film, uh, which which is, uh, and they're beautifully photographed too. Uh, right now, I, I've, I've had uh, Tarzan's fight for life um, on for the past hour or so. And uh, I, I wish, uh, this, the, the set that I have is a Warner Brothers set that was issued a few years ago. And it has all of uh, Gordon Scott's Tarzan films in it from uh, his first one, uh, Tarzan's Hidden Jungle, on up to Tarzan the Magnificent, uh, which is a fantastic movie, by the way. It's one of my favorite movies. It, it's just such a, well, we'll talk about it in a bit, but what a great movie. Um, anyway, uh, that was obviously my first exposure to uh, Gordon Scott, uh, the actor, um, because those were his first films. He, he was not, you know, an actor per se. He started out, um, you know, just as a, a your GI coming home after World War II, it worked a variety of d different jobs, um, got married time or two, we're not really sure. <laughs> um, and uh, wound up in Las Vegas as a hotel lifeguard and was spotted for films. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, Lana Turner at uh, Schwab's drugstore. I mean, it's kind of a classic uh, discovery, you know, being discovered, you know, as a hotel lifeguard. I mean, how, does it get better than that? You know, no. And, uh, you know, he uh, was uh, like a, one of my, probably my, no, no, not probably. He is my favorite Tarzan, uh, most definitely. Uh, he you know, had the athleticism, but as, as he made more films, as as they started to make Tarzan you know, more of a three dimensional character, um, he he was sort of in that transition. You know, he went from you know me Tarzan, you Jane, to you know, being the you know, more of a more of an intellectual uh, Tarzan. Uh, if you look at the progression of his Tarzan films, you know, from beginning to end, uh, some of them were better than others. Um, the last two uh, films that Gordon Scott made as Tarzan, I, I, th I think were the best ones, to tell you the truth. Uh, I'd, I'd already mentioned his last one, Tarzan the Magnificent. Um, and that's, that's a really great movie. Uh, Jock Mahoney is uh, you know, uh, Tarzan's foe in it. And it's interesting that the next Tarzan film would star Jock Mahoney. <laughs> but uh, in Tarzan's Greatest Adventure, it's, it's his penultimate, penultimate uh, Tarzan film, I think it's really good as well. It's got a really strong cast. Sean Connery's in it, you know, um, and it, it, does it get better than that? Silla Gable, Anthony Quayle, uh, it, it's, it's got a pretty good cast. Um, but it, the best one really is Tarzan the Magnificent. If you hadn't seen um, one of Gordon Scott's movies, and you, know, you wanted to see, if in my in my opinion, his best movie, that would be it. it it's it, it's a it's directed well, it's scripted well, it's got some really good acting for some from some quality actors in it. You know, people who are very experienced, and and the two principals, I I can't imagine you know two two better you know, foes to go at, you know, two Tarzans, you know, in, in essence, that you should get in this movie. I, I think that's reason enough to watch it just for that. But it, but it is a fantastic film. 
It's been a while since I uh, saw those uh, Tarzans. And I think I also have a collection of them on DVD uh, of all the early uh, Tarzan films, including mm-hmm. Gordon Scott's. I have to dig it out now and watch it. Um, I guess maybe it was back in the 90s or early 2000s. Uh, Turner Classic Movies uh, ran them and they had you know, good prints. And you know, we you know, recorded them uh, off uh, t- Turner. Uh, at the time, and then converted them over to DVD. But when they finally released the Gordon Scott uh, Tarzan films uh, in that Warner Brothers set, uh, we went ahead and, and got it because our copies look good. But but these are you know the real deal, and and, and they're and they're terrific films. And like I said, one of my favorite actors. I got to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean he he made he. He had a career, you know, after Tarzan, and he made a variety of films. Uh, he he went into peplums, uh, where he, he was a good peplum star, as well. His acting, he, he got you know he he improved you know over time. He was he's a very natural actor too, you know, kind of like Gordon Mitchell in that respect. Um, he was just you know, didn't need a whole lot of instruction. Seemed to know what he was doing. He, he, Self confidence really comes across on the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, if you've got self confidence, that's a very attractive feature. And I think that that um, I'm not saying that that makes up for you know lack of experience or anything like that. But charisma is charisma. Yeah, you, know, you can't really buy it. You, know, you can't teach it to anybody. It just comes from within. And he's one of those actors. You can. He could have been a mess inside when he was doing this. Who knows? But he looks really confident in the role. Um, and he, he delivers his lines well, and he does it strongly, and doesn't look puzzled you know, for a second. He just looks, he does a really good job in the films. Um, and like his, his peplums are really good, too. Uh, of note for me is that, you know, I'm a huge Eurospy uh, fan, and so many of the peplum stars you know, did do, uh, or did appear in some Euro spy movies. Um, you know, Brad Harris, you know, famously did, did a, a string of them, really. Um, Dan uh, Vadis uh, wasn't the hero in Euro spy. He was usually the villain, but that's kind of cool too. You know, Richard Harrison uh, did some Euro spy movies uh, and Gordon Scott did a couple. Uh, one, of, one of his Euro spy movies is probably one of my top 20 favorite movies. It's called Danger Death Ray. It's not a great film by any means, but it's an interesting one. It's got a got an interesting international cast in it. You can see some of the uh, actors, some of the supporting players. You can see in any number of Peplum movies. You know, a lot of the Peplum uh, actors and actresses just shifted. <laughs> You know, last week they were making a Peplum movie. This week they're, you know, in, in Eurospy. Next week it's a Spaghetti Western. Spaghetti Western, um, yeah. But you get to see a lot of those same people. And you know, they were experienced. I mean, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew how to, you know, either be liked or hated, you know, by the audience um, for the film. And that, that's a fantastic talent. It's, it's, it's good to know your audience, uh, which is something I need to impress upon my students starting next Wednesday (laughs) but no it is I mean if if you know your audience you're going to be able to you know communicate that emotion or or read that line so much more effectively very very true and have you ever seen any he's he made two year of spy movies uh one's called top secret and the other one my favorite uh, is called danger death ray those both sound familiar. Chances are in my long lifetime of watching all sorts of cinema that I've seen them, but right now they don't resonate with any images. Uh, I have not seen all of Top Secret because the only copies that I can find of it are really difficult to watch. Uh, very you know, highly pixelated. It's kind of hard for these old eyes to you know, figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, not much contrast in terms of color, which makes it even harder. Um, I just haven't, I haven't been able to find a good copy of it. And that's kind of my problem with some of Gordon Scott's non-Tarzan movies. A lot of his peplums are really in rough shape. It's kind of hard to find you know, watchable you know, versions, the ones that, that don't have color that's so blown, blown out, it looks black and white again, you know, or 
or really blue and red, I guess that would probably be a better way to put it. Uh, Hero of Rome has a pretty good, at least I have a pretty good copy of it, but it's pan and scan. It's like, ah, oh, geez, you know, th this would have been so much better, you know, with widescreen. Widescreen. Um, but you, know, despite that, and unfortunately, you know, Gordon Scott only acted until he was in his late 30s, and then he uh, packed it up and seemingly had some other adventures uh, throughout his life. It, was, it seemed to be a pretty colorful man, too. Um, Based on some things that I've I've read uh, about him, he you would just I I don't mean for this word to have a negative the negative connotation that it might, but he was kind of a drifter, you know. Um, he you know, just worked a variety of odd jobs. One thing you know led to another. Moved around a whole lot uh, you know, before you know his film career. And after his film career, seemed to do about the same thing, just kind yeah. of you know um, ebbed and flowed, you know, from one place to the other for the rest of his life, and seemingly no visible means of support. You know, he now he did he did earn uh, you know some pretty good salaries, especially when he was making films. Um, you know, I think his highest salary was something close to a quarter of a million dollars on. Film. Wow. I mean, the early '60s money. I mean, that's impressive. Really great, but unfortunately, but unfortunately, he didn't make that much in every movie, um, and he he didn't make that much as Tarzan, um, and he of course he didn't get you know, a residual cut or anything like that that back then. Um, and you know, like I said, from what I've read, and you know what, I'll, the disclaimer here is that. Um, what I'm about to say is based on the, my recent research and my recollections uh, from over the last 25 years or so. Um, he seemed to be, I don't want to say a gigolo, but, but, but a ladies man, perhaps. Uh, and uh, you, I, I, hate, I hesitate to say this, but I've, I've known a few actors in my day who after their careers were over, um, might have made a living out of just being nice to, to, to some older folks, if you know what I mean. Yes. I'm not, I don't know that I don't know that he that Gordon Scott specifically did that, but I, I have heard you know a few things here. Um, but I mean, you can see why he, he even in uh, his his late thirties, if you watch some of his uh, last films, he's still in fantastic shape, a really handsome guy. Too, um, you know, in many ways, every bit as handsome as Steve Reeves. Uh, you know, great looking guy. Why wouldn't you capitalize on that? You know, as, as, so I certainly uh, might understand that. I know that uh, toward you know at the end of his life, certainly in his later years, um, he kind of drifted from you know like fan to fan essentially. Um, he did a lot of uh, you know shows on the autograph circuit. Uh, mm -hmm. from the 90s up until not too long before he passed away and you know you can make great money you know at yes. those you know, signing, eight by, now. signing eight by tens and you know photographs i mean those are huge if you charge fifty dollars you know for a you know a selfie um or something like that and you got enough people you could walk away you know to, you know, count money like crazy um, I have you know, certain uh, you know, fringe actors, like, like Vampire, for example, who was in um, some Ed Wood movies and was you know, the, the, the first horror hostess on television. Um, she would regularly walk away with about 10 grand uh, okay. after, uh, after an autograph convention. And it's somebody who, like I said, who's, was pretty fringe, you know, uh, even back then. To, but to walk away with that kind of money out of, out of one day. Uh, and basically all you're doing is signing your name and posing for photos. I and mean, wow, you know, <laughs> if you could do it every day, you'd be rich. <laughs> oh, but, you can, but you can make decent money doing that. And uh, you, we have Steel City Con, uh, you know, in this area of Pittsburgh quite a bit. And I, I follow a lot of that on uh, social media. And I'm shocked at the lines to see some, some of the actors from Star Trek uh, or uh, actors from you know uh, you know certain horror film franchises are always really popular, uh, and they make bank. I mean, they do a great job. 
uh, they, they do they make a lot of money. And Gordon Scott was one of those people you know, back in the 90s who did it. And he did it with some other Peplum stars, you know, um, which is great. I mean, I think it's it's good to, to get out there and, you know, for, for the cost of, you know, an autographed eight by 10, you get to meet somebody whose work you've been admiring your whole life. I mean, right. How, you know, how many people get to do that? Not very many, uh, unless you go to an autograph convention. <laughs> And or then you can convention can't. really any any convention really like there's side well, that's true you're right we, uh, my wife and I bumped before we connected with each other we bumped into each other quite a bit uh, in the science fiction horror conventions of uh, New York City uh, I had a magazine back then she actually was one of the uh, contributors to, to to the magazine too but it, we didn't connect again until years years uh, later. Um, and we didn't recognize each other when we were first connected. But yeah, those conventions are a great place to get to meet the celebrities, to hang out with them. Uh, and it's also a good place to meet other people who are in your general area who have the same interests. Yes. You know, it, it's a great place to come together. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, we, we, we both like this person. What's your, what's your favorite film of his? Oh, that's mine too. You, you know, I mean, it's, um, when we've done stuff like that, uh, in Pittsburgh, it's kind of fun to see who else likes the same kind of entertainment that you do, especially if you like stuff that's on the fringe. You know, uh, if, if you go see uh, Top Gun Maverick or something like that, you're going to see pretty much cross section of individuals in your local area. I mean, it's going right. to be a little bit of everything. But if you do go to something, you know, so specific as, um, you know, um, a horror convention or something like that. You're going to meet your people. <laughs> what a great place to go. Your tribe, yeah. Uh, and, and what a lot of fun. And those people spend money too um, because you're giving them exactly what they want and that they can't get anywhere else. So they are they are there to drop some change on you. So smile you know, and enjoy it. Now you have to find a way to make education, you know, so become a celebrity in the field of education in Pittsburgh. And no, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm probably, yeah, I'm probably going to retire here in the next year or so. I'm eager to look in a different direction. I, yeah, I've, been, I've, I've been doing this all my whole adult life. You know, I, I, not, I don't want to piss on it or anything like that, but I, but I, th I think it's just time to do something else. How about with the Brian Stryven Theater? Because that's that's uh, what you're best known for in in that uh, circle of uh, people. You're world famous in that circle of people. Well, you know, it has occurred to me that not I don't want to I don't want to necessarily remain in this area. I, I'd kind of like to explore you know a, a different part of the country. Um, maybe not that far away. Who knows? Um, but uh, not too far from here, there is a, a drive-in theater that was not open this year that I am going to guess is probably going to be up for sale before too long. It's probably 35, 40 minutes from here. It had occurred to me, and it's, it, from what I recall, it, it could stand, you know, some capital investment. <laughs> and I, I, I'm very much doubt that it has digital projection, but. It'd be nice if it did, but I, I bet it doesn't. It's got two screens, though. It had occurred to me just to do something like that, just to, to do something really insane uh, and you know, start a business like that. Um, if I were to do something like that, I, I would almost need that digital projection equipment because, you know, I, some of, a lot of the drive-ins in this area show whatever is popular that week you know they show the same things now that you see you know in the big megaplex uh theater complexes you, you know what i mean yes it's the same movies and that's nice but we have a few drive-ins out there the mahoney uh in la Heighton, pennsylvania for example and they they have all night programs where they are showing old grindhouse horror movies and they they, they will theme them so you'll get uh, like, a, you know, a, a night of serial killers or, you know, like a universal horror night or something like that. Um, that's the way to go for me. Yes, it because, is. For me because too. there again, you know, you will draw people 
you know, to your location, no matter where it's at, uh, you, a, a certain subset of people anyway. And if you let them camp out all night, well, hey, you know, I mean, <laughs> there again, you're going to have concession sales all night long if you can find employees to staff it all night long, but, but you'd be willing to do so. It'd be a lot of fun too. have people come in costume and things. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, get some vendors there. You know, uh, if you don't want to run the concession stand yourself, get some food trucks in. Yeah, you definitely. Know. That that works, and I'd love to go to something like that. I used to love going to the conventions that were themed and and dressing mm -hmm. up and acting the part. Uh, now, of course, what they do with cosplay puts what we did back in the day to shame because we didn't have yes. all, all the computerized and 3D printing that they have now. But it was still a lot of fun to dress up and to go there and to you know, play the part of, you know, whatever you wanted to play the part of and interact with other people who were playing parts. And uh, it, it was just a lot of uh, fun. Um, I was doing, and I started a security force made up of people in costumes. <laughs> so we were uh, guarding and protecting the celebrities and uh, we got to meet a lot of them that way. And uh, it, it was, it was fun. I, I did that for over a decade and I'm, I'm not sorry for any minute of it. It was a great thing to do. And I, I look back on many fond memories. So I, I've entertained doing something like that. Uh, we've actually talked about maybe starting a memorabilia slash antique business, you know, perhaps. Um, I, I think we've, I think we know enough about certain segments of the antique market that we would probably not lose our shirts. I don't, I don't know how, how profitable it would be. Uh, I, I know movie memorabilia really well. My partner knows, uh, vintage, uh, toys, um, very well. Um, in between the two of us, we could, I, I think do pretty well, you know, uh, the only problem that I have is I tend to just consume, you know, I just, I, I bring things home. You know, the other part of that equation is, you know, pushing product out and I'm not good at that because I, I, I guess they're my toys. I want to keep them. I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> it's probably not a good way to base a business on. When we had our store, we found ourselves putting stuff that we, you know, that we, we would theoretically get rid of one day in the store. And then it would sell. And if we wanted something back, if it hadn't sold, we could always take it off, take it off the shelf and bring it back home. Uh, <laughs> that worked pretty well. Most of the inventory we had initially when we first opened up was stuff that was sitting around the house in our different uh, collections, mm -hmm. you know, uh, either gathering dust or sitting in a box. <laughs> so uh, they, they found new homes and, uh, you know, we were able to sell them to people who wanted them. And, uh, uh, it was a lot less uh, unpredictable than online selling. Well, and we've got like, like duplicates and triplicates of things. Um, you, you find one, but you, let, let, let's say it's an, an antique, you know, of some sort. You find one, and it's a, an okay shape. Then a few years later, you find one, but boy, it's, it's in better shape. And then a few years later, you find ah, this this is the nice one. Well, suddenly these other two have got crap. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and you need and you need to move them on. You know, to to another collector. Um, there you go. And and but I'm not famous for doing that. <laughs> like I said, I, I just keep. I I don't push stuff out. And uh, I'm not a hoarder or anything like that. I, and when I'm when I'm done with the product, I'm well, it's done to tell you the truth. But 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 when I'm done with something, I'm done with it. Do you um, have any? So, so I'm not. Hmm? Do you have any Gordon Scott collectibles? I've got a number of lobby cards uh, of Gordon Scott's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything signed. And I, I don't believe I have a poster that's bigger than a lobby card. I don't think I have a one sheet or anything like that. I'd have to go back and check to be sure. But I think I've just got a bunch of lobby cards. Was there ever a miniature oh. of him or a, like an action figure or uh, any type of merch with uh, many of the roles that he took, any of his movies get to that? Well, point? he he was, uh, you know, like like so many actors in roles in the 50s, uh, he was in a series of comic books. OK, um, I don't have any of those. Uh, I have seen a number of them. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, they're very well done and they're Dell or something like that. Yes, you know, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a good quality, you know, uh, publication. I mean, it's not anything, you know, it's not a zine or anything like that. Uh, it, it's a nice, nice product. Uh, I've never seen like any lunch boxes that I thought looked like Gordon Scott, but I think that was more of a 60s thing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, speaking of collectibles, you see a lot of lunch boxes uh, when you're out there looking for them. Uh, you know, like the lunch boxes that we had when we were kids. Yes, those, I remember uh, those. those stamped tin things that would have, I don't know, like a, like a teen idol or something like that on them, or, or it would be themed around a cartoon or a television show. Or a TV show, yeah. Yeah. I had a number of them. I remember going with my parents every year before school started to get a new mm -hmm. lunchbox and whatever yeah. show I was into at the time, if they had a lunchbox, that became my lunchbox for the year. Sometimes my mom picked mine out. So ugh, it, you know, <laughs> the first one that I got, and I, I don't know how I ended up with this because I had it way before I went to school. Uh, it was Rat Patrol, you know, with okay. Christopher George. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't watch Rat Patrol. I, it, I I could have only been about two years old when it was on. <laughs> you know, I, so I don't know really how I came to get that one. I didn't use it very long. I I, I think I had uh, I had a Scooby Doo when I uh, Scooby Doo was new at the time. You know, he, in the early seventies, I had Hair Bear Bunch, which was another mm -hmm. uh, Hanna Barbera uh, cartoon. They were uh, bears. But they were truckers and had CB radios. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> Made for a good lunchbox. I had a really cool Harlem Glo Harlem Globetrotters. Uh -huh. you, the, there was a cartoon in the early seventies. Yes, yes, I remember. They they had an elderly female bus driver, um, and, and they were in cartoon form. They had a bus. Well, anyway, the the lunchbox had the bus on it. Uh, I can't find the lunchbox, oddly enough, but I found the thermos. Usually oh. the thermos is the thing that goes missing, mm -hmm. but you've got the lunchbox. And for me, it's exactly the opposite. I don't know what happened uh, to the lunchbox. Maybe it fell apart or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what happened to a lot of those. I suspect my father threw, threw them out. Uh, I hated Well, that's what they were. That, that's what you were supposed to do with them, quite honestly. <laughs> I think that's what made me a collector, the fact that he threw out all my stuff all the time, you know, so uh, once I was no longer there, it's like no one's going to throw out my stuff anymore. You know? So I kept everything. And like you, I bring things home and put it in treasure places, some things I can't even find anymore. Uh, but it's always it was, it's always a pleasant thing while you're searching for something else to come across. It. It's like, oh, this is where this went. It, you know, I was fortunate in that. Um... Yeah, my mother really didn't throw out a whole lot of stuff. Um, well, the truth. Uh, she's got the space for it, though. She's got this huge house, uh, and it's just crammed, you know, full of... Now, I'm not a hoarder. She might be. Uh, she's not watching this, though. It's okay for me to say. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, if she spent money on it, she is not letting it go. <laughs> And she did save a lot of my old toys. And fortunately, I was an only child. So I was the only one that played with my toy, other than neighborhood kids and things like that. Uh -huh. But they, my toys didn't go through like four or five siblings, you know. So, I mean, you can tell what I liked to play with because that's the stuff that's in rougher shape. Um, but my stuff overall is not in bad shape. I think my, my partner was kind of surprised when he, when we started pulling that stuff out years ago and he was like, Hmm, this <laughs> looks all right. Yeah. I, I, the, the things I kept uh, that didn't get thrown out, I still treasured them to this uh, day. And some of them are peplum things, some peplum things that came across uh, later, uh, like uh, my good friend, uh, Jeff Hogue. Um, he's a movie maker and uh, he gave me the sons of Hercules game. I feel what the occasion was. Mm. <laughs> So that was like really cool. It, it didn't seem like uh, all that complicated to play. Uh, you were different Sons of Hercules and you were in some contests competing. You had to get rings and the first person who got a certain number of rings uh, would win. Um, mm. it, it's a fun thing to have. It has lots of cool little pieces and mm -hmm. you know, board, just like an arena. And it has 
Uh, and then I found that there were jigsaw puzzles. And I think I found one of them uh, for the Mighty Sons of Hercules. Hmm. I, I didn't know there was any kind of marketing like, like a jigsaw puzzle. That's cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. And uh, uh, so I, now I look for old merch. If it's uh, something I, I really get into, I look for anything that's out there. I'm a sucker when it comes to movie memorabilia. Um, I, I absorb lobby cards. I mean, they're just, <laughs> you know, some of them, it might be in, in fantastic shape or, you know, perhaps it's a film that I really like, or maybe it's just got a great image of, you know, of the characters in the film. Uh, but I'm always drawn to them. And they seem to be everywhere uh, that, that I go. I stumble upon them. I actually, even more so than lobby cards, I've got a window card. Uh, uh -huh. kind of fetish too uh i love the size of window cards they're um i think they're they're either 12 by 36 or 14 by 36 i can't quite remember um but they're you know narrow but but tall and you get a nice slice of you know the, the one sheet poster in it anyway mm -hmm. you, you you get the best you know, graphic images of it and they're narrow so you know if you want to work more into a wall space you can do it um and i and i really like window cards a lot you know for, for that reason that they're they're not the easiest things to frame but you can do it yourself and um you they give you a lot of bang for your buck yeah i, I never got into the lobby cards uh um, because they had no room for them uh, well i mean that is a problem <laughs> i, I have I have friends who collect lobby cards and they have like storage rooms full of lobby cards and posters and, and things like that. So uh, I, I never had uh, a space enough to collect them, but who knows what the future will bring. If I wind up in a large enough uh, house or, or, or something, uh, I can store them there and start collecting them. Well, you know, if you don't frame them, uh, they don't take up, it's paper, so it doesn't take up that much space. Now you have to store them properly. Yes. Um, and in you know, wrapping them, I think is a good idea, and keeping them in a, you know, uh, moisture-free, um, you know, cool environment is another another factor. They they need to be kept in a climate-controlled uh, area, and because if they're not, the, it, that accelerates the yellowing, of, you know, the acid in the paper and, and the yellowing in the in the paper. Um, and you know, the crisper and cleaner you can keep them, the better. I mean, they, they do display better. That's not just, I, I'm not saying all my stuff's in fantastic shape, um, but I, I really like, you know, I've got a nice collection of half sheets. I like the half sheets because they are kind of wall friendly. Um, they're, there again, I don't quote me on the size. I think they're 22 by 28. Mm -hmm. I think that's the size of a half sheet. Um it's somewhere in that neighborhood and that's you know that's a pretty nice you know sized wall hanging and you can put two or three together you know you can string them um and you know, there again you know they're big enough so that they kind of make a statement you know it, as long as your uh you know furniture isn't too busy if you go with something neutral you can get away with using uh um, you know, old, 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 you know, fifties and sixties exploitation posters as wall art. At least I've been doing it for the last 30 years or so. <laughs> I have small pictures. Uh, uh, where I'm I'm we got big, we have big stuff. Yeah. I, this entire wall is covered in nothing but pictures. I have uh, some ancient Greek uh, things and, but mostly peplum. I have uh, Steve Reeves uh, in Hercules. I have the rock in Hercules. I have uh um, Reg Park, uh, uh, Hercules uh, in the Underworld. Uh, I have Lou Ferrigno from either Hercules or the Adventures of Hercules, can't tell where. I have the Marvel Hercules. Uh, I have uh, um, uh, from a calendar in an, a game called Invictus that came out forever ago. <laughs> All surrounded me and I work out uh, in here also. So they inspire me while I, while I work out. So is that your, uh, for lack of a better word, your office? It's in the, the bedroom. 
So, okay. It's like one one entire wall of the bedroom is totally mine. So I have like bookshelves and I have all these pictures on my weights, you know, so this is, uh, it's an all purpose thing. We have the curtain in the back so I could block it off, you know. Ah, okay. And once I figure out how to do the back screens, I'll have back screens, I'll put the Acropolis or, or Mount Olympus or something back there. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually, when it comes to movie posters, I, I'm not as bad as you know, some of your friends who have like entire rooms that are devoted to uh, the storage. Um, a lot of my nicest stuff, to tell you the truth, is on the walls. It's the stuff that, you know, I've framed, um, you know, over the years. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to have a few things that are autographed, um, mm. which is great. Unfortunately, I've missed a couple of opportunities to have some things autographed too. Um, I do have a beach party poster uh, that has the autographs of uh, Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello, um, which is, it's a beautiful thing. And it's uh, hanging up just beside me, it's right here, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, and I've got a, uh, a photograph um, that was autographed by Donna Winter and Kevin McCarthy from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, wow, that, that is cool. It is. Unfortunately, I, I had it, where, where I had it in my house, it was not in direct sun, but close to a window and the uh, autograph started bleaching out Ooh. on it. So I took it down and it's just sitting in a closet right now. I, I don't, I don't really know what to do with it at this point. Uh, I've, in my bedroom, I've got a, uh, an auto, I have an autographed photo of Yvonne DiCarlo. Uh, that, oh, very that's nice. Really, that's really nice. I, have, uh, I think I showed this one to you, but I've got one of Zachary now that I mm -hmm. bought in Pittsburgh uh, a couple of, well, two or three months ago, something like that. Um, I've got Judy Canova, you know, a few other kind of oddball. I like fringe people, you know. Um, I, and, and those are the autographs that kind of, the, not that Yvonne DiCarlo is French, uh, but, but you know what I mean. Uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, just uh, people who weren't necessarily A-listers. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's the best way to put it. But, but they're, they're some of my favorites, so. Mine as well. Anyway, uh, you were going, you were, we got off of this tangent because you asked me if I had any Gordon Scott memorabilia. And there is one thing I neglected to mention. Um, you remember the old Viewmaster? Um, yes, I remember. Was, all of us, I, everybody yes. had one. You know, in the days before VCRs, if you wanted to see like something in color or kind of, in kind of a three dimensional, uh, you got either a Sawyer, depending on how, how old you are, you either had a Sawyer. Uh, Viewmaster, or later on when I became when I was a kid, GAF had bought Sawyer, so they owned the Viewmaster. So, so my Viewmaster was a GAF uh, version, but my mom still has her old Sawyer um, oh, cool. uh, Viewmaster, and she's got a ton of old reels. You know, and a lot of them are travel things like national parks, the painted desert. Uh, I mean, they're pretty to look at, you know, um, and you know, travel was the thing, you know, back in the 50s when she was a girl. Well, she's got one set of three reels of Gordon Scott as Tarzan. Oh, wow. That and awesome. uh, yeah, and, and she still had it, it, it's all complete. It's in very good shape. She still has the sleeve that it, that it came in with with the picture of Gordon Scott uh, as Tarzan. Now that that's and she's got all of it, you know, all of it all together. Um, and those things aren't really worth anything. You, you see them all the time in antique places and such. Um, but I, I can vividly remember, you know, putting. You, the person in those Viewmasters together with you know, the person who was in the Tarzan film that I just watched you know, as a child. So uh -huh. finally, it was like, oh, I'm okay. I, I see who this is. Um, so uh, we do have, there, there was some memorabilia uh, created in the 50s. I spoke too soon. Um, you, I, I'm, I'm sure he didn't get a cut of that. 
Um, but he was in those Viewmaster. I don't know how many of those he did. Uh, she just had the like the one series. Um, there were there were three of the three of the reels. He um, maybe was the, Tarzan for that long too. He might have been in whatever Tarzan merch was uh, available. Like uh, remember those pads? They used to put every time a new movie came out, they'd make those uh, pads uh, where you can uh, write on it and then you lift up the sheet and they, it would erase it. Yeah, I yeah. used to put anything uh, on there. Mm -hmm. um, I am not. Uh, I really haven't seen much in the way of uh, memorabilia in that time period. I see a lot more Ron Ely stuff, but I think that's because he was in the television series. And you, a, a lot of memorabilia for children in the in the fifties and sixties came from television. You know, as much as anything else, um, and, and maybe perhaps not so much film. How did Gordon Scott pass? Um, you know, uh, he had at one point drifted uh, to. Well, that, that's not. A, he was living in uh, Cottonwood, Arizona, with um, you know a, a friend or a fan or something like that, and the situation went sour and he ended up living in Baltimore of all places, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And, uh, you know, passed away. I, I think he was having some heart problems, uh, you know, by the, when he did pass away, he'd been a pretty heavy smoker, uh, too. And I don't know that he ever quit. Uh, and he was about 80 years old, you know, when he passed away and, you know, for, for somebody who smoked, his whole life I mean, that's a that's a really good long life you know I, i've known yeah. i've known healthier i've known people with healthier habits that haven't lived nearly so long so um but but that that is sadly how he passed from what i understand um he had at least two kids uh one by his first wife who was born and she was a daughter born in the late 1940s and he had uh, one by vera miles uh the the, the famous actress who was still with us. Um, they were, she was his leading lady in Tarzan's Hidden Jungle. Uh, they had a romance and she divorced her husband um, and they got married, had a son. And apparently she didn't know that he'd been married before. Um, mm. And uh, the relationship soured <laughs> after that. I don't know why, because she, she, she was married before, yeah. She's married a number of times. Um, very beautiful woman uh, and a great actress, too. I mean, she's, if you watch, you know, her, you, in, in the 50s, you see her popping up in all kinds of different roles, you know. Uh, but, and she's great in all of them. She, she's fantastic as Janet Lee's sister in Psycho. Um, Vera Miles, and she did all of those. Uh, I think she was in every Quinn Martin television show. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was she was his good luck charm so he would put her in the pilot uh, in order to sell the series uh, you know as a guest star you know, she was um, I don't know why he never thought to put her you know let's build let's build a series around fear you know if, if you think so much of her to put her in your pilots well heck just you know, make yeah. her the star. um but he didn't for whatever reason maybe she didn't want that who knows um but she would have been good at it though um and she's if you if you watch her performances she's she's a good heroine and she's a good antagonist too she can be kind of nasty uh in some of her roles um if you if you i don't know if you saw psycho 2 uh that came out in the early 1980s long time ago uh, in the theater yeah, when it came well, out. I mean, it's it's the sequel to the original you know, Psycho, but uh, her character in it's really, her character in Psycho it, it seems like a nice person, but her character in Psycho 2 is not. At least that's my read on it. Maybe I'm not remembering it correctly, but she's not a, a, a very nice person in Psycho 2. And she's very believable. Um, and like I said, just a, so talented and, and just gorgeous. I mean, a beautiful woman. Has she, uh, has uh, their child uh, by either, has his children rather by either marriage uh, gotten involved in the fandom or uh, done anything to keep his memory alive? 
Well, uh, sadly, he seems to have been estranged from pretty much anybody he was ever related to. Uh, he was born into a big family. He was the last of nine children. And wow. his, his siblings had not heard from him in decades. Uh, and I, I don't know that his daughter you know, had either. Uh, and she would be probably mid-70s by now. I did hear once that you briefly he had in, he ended up staying with his son for a while. Uh, he'd, he'd gotten sick uh, and was kind of between living situations. It, it was living with his son for a little while, but I I don't know what happened after that. Well, I mean, he wound up in Baltimore and he wasn't living with his son, so. But he's kind left of, us. Kind of sad. It, it is sad, but he's left yeah. us with lots of uh, memories uh, through his uh, entertainment uh, work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, uh, no secret here, he's my favorite you know, Tarzan actor. And, well, it's hard, harder for me to pick a favorite Peplum actor. So there, there, there's more of them, but, but, but certainly you're one of the top three for me. For, for me, as you know, it's uh, Nigel Green. Oh, I, yes. <laughs> Sergio Ciani, a.k.a. Uh, Allard. Yeah. Steel. Uh, I like uh, Steve Reeves and Reg. Mm -hmm. uh, Very Park. much. And uh, I, Reg, Reg, Reg Park I, is awesome. I yeah, wish he yeah. made more films. And uh, I'm gonna, we don't really have enough time to go totally off topic, uh, no. but uh, um, Hercules Against Rome is now on YouTube. There are several people who posted it. It wasn't there before, and now it's there. Uh, pretty clean copies uh, from what I can see. I posted it on uh, in the Sword and Sandal Cinema groups. Mm. Very good. Um, yeah, and you know, for, for somebody who... Um, you know, hasn't been exposed to uh, you know Gordon Scott's films. Give him a shot. Um, he he's very watchable. Like I said, clearly a lot of self confidence. Um, very charismatic, um, and I think he really did justice, especially to the Tarzan role. Um, and he did take Tarzan out. And I I have respect for for all of these films, and I'm not deriding them or anything like that. But some of the Lex Barker, and I like Lex Barker a lot, but some of his Tarzan films, I, I, I know that he's on a backstage set. I, you know, I can tell. <laughs> and, and nothing was done location. Well, they did do a lot of location shooting for Gordon Scott's movies. Not all of them, um, but they did do some. And they did some early on that they wove into like, some of the later ones. Um, but uh, particularly the last two films, Tarzan's Great Adventure and um, a Tarzan the Magnificent, I, I mean, it, it, they're expensive. It's lo location shooting, nice sets when they're on sets, um, high quality films, and thrilling too. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a great sense of adventure in them. And I, if, if you were only going to watch one Tarzan film, I would say watch Tarzan the Magnificent because it's the best one. Uh, out of all of them. I have to dig up my collection and watch it. Uh, the last Tarzan film I saw in the past few years was uh, Tarzan with Miles O'Keefe and Bo Derek. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that one. Well, yeah, there is. the big problem with that one <laughs> is that Tarzan's not the star. He's right. Not on, he's not on screen that often. I mean, well, it's not called Bo Derek the Magnificent. It's Tarzan the Magnificent. <laughs> you know, where's where's my protagonist at? Um, and I and I I'm not stupid enough to to think that you know that John Derek wasn't going to put his wife you know in every scene of the movie. Um, and you know, lovely woman that she is, she's just not an actress. Um, I I don't have anything against her, um, but she, she's not an actress. So why not let Tarzan do his thing? And and they kind of you know, they plucked him out of obscurity, uh, Miles. Yes, Chris. and he had a career after that. And some of his some of his adventure films, uh, you know, and he he does some you know, sword and sorcery movies. They're a lot of fun, and he's good. Ator, yes, he was he was Ator. Ator, I love that movie because the tattoo from the villain kept moving <laughs> from shot to shot. <laughs> 
moving tattoos. <laughs> you're, you're right. But they're but they're, he's good in them and he, and they're fun, you know. Yeah, and I enjoy them. There's a lot of athleticism in it too, so it, it's fun to watch. You know, it, it's kind of thrilling. Um, I, there's there's nothing wrong with him at with Miles at Keith as Tarzan at all. I thought he was he only got to do it once and he didn't get to do it a whole lot in that movie, unfortunately. But, but he did um, it well. He was believable. And, and and, and he was a kind of a different looking Tarzan. You know, every time we get a new Tarzan, you sort of get a new archetype, you, mm -hmm. you know, in front of you. Johnny Johnny Weissmull, uh, for example, you had that that lean swimmer build, which okay, you know, if you're living in the jungle, you're you probably eating pretty much a keto diet, you know, <laughs> not a not a whole lot of carbs around, uh, unless you count all the bananas, you, you know. Um, so you probably would be, you know, athletic but lean, you know, and you know Gordon Scott's this you know, big, robust, you know, uh, Tarzan, uh, you know, very, you know, very muscular, very strong, and in between the two, you've got Lex Barker, who you know, I mean, very nice body too, but extremely handsome uh, man, you know, way too handsome to be just out in the woods somewhere <laughs> you, you know in, in the jungle uh but but you, you get it like i said you get a different archetype and when you know, jock mahoney took over as tars and you kind of had you know, middle-aged stars and i mean they're again a handsome man uh you know in very good shape a very athletic um but he, he didn't have the, you know the big the big broad shouldered you know beefcake uh tarzan looked at uh gordon scott had and then there was uh, ron ely who was you know kind of a, another different body type um and miles o'keefe he he couldn't have had any body fat in that movie uh if you watch it i mean there's just there's none there <laughs> it's just you know, it's just him, just a skeleton and muscle and that's it I believe he wasn't even an actor. He was involved in the production on the other side of the camera. And then they they, they just realized that he'd make a great uh, Tarzan. I used to know the story. I don't remember it, uh, though. Well, and he played football as a college student, uh, too. But but there again, you know, people weren't as um, seemingly as beefy back then as they are now. Uh, do you know what, do you know what I mean? It, I, I know what you mean. It, it was pre-steroids too. You know, now we have the the steroid uh, bodybuilder that represents well, the bodybuilding. Yeah, there's that. But but also, if you if you look at old like old family movies or you know old, old home movies or something like that, when you look at people like 50 years ago, by and large, they were all much thinner. Yes. You know, and um, I, I think you know, a lot of that's just the changes in our diet, um, you know, more, more so than anything else. I really do. And, and you know, I'm not saying all the changes aren't for, are, are for the worse. Um, I'm sure some of them are, are, are for the better. Uh, people don't smoke like they used to. Um, and I think that kept a lot of people artificially thin. You know, because you're putting such a toll on your heart that it's beating right. like crazy, you know, <laughs> keeping your metabolism up, so, so so you can burn you know two donuts you know, that you eat every morning. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? Um, but I mean, people. Well, and I work on a college campus, and you know, I'm roughly six feet tall. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a little guy by any means. And when I was that age, I don't remember feeling short or small. Uh -huh. And when I'm on campus now, everybody's taller than I am. I mean, I'm looking up at you know, all these kids and I'm like, hey, what is in the water? You know, <laughs> they are all, I mean, they're all taller than I am. Yeah, I, I don't know why that is uh, either. I, 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 there's, I there's part of me is shrinking, I guess, with age and I'm getting shorter. I, Maybe I don't. Well, I mean, there there, there is that, but I, is it the hormones in the milk? I mean, what is it? You know, I, everybody's just taller and, and, and bigger now. Or maybe it's just that I am shrinking. I'm getting smaller and smaller and smaller. No, well, oh, hi, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> and we've come to the end of our hour. Um, how can people get in contact with you? 
Well, if you want to talk about Gordon Scott or any other uh, of your favorite actors, hopefully it's a favorite of mine, you can uh, contact me on social media through Facebook. Uh, just search for Brian Strive in Theater, uh, and I should turn up. I'm also on Twitter, but I'm a worker on Twitter, so it's <laughs> harder for me to harder harder to interact with me on Twitter. I'm on it every day, but I haven't tweeted in a long, long time. Uh, and you can always visit the um, new and improved Brian Strive in Theater. I'm still not done with the update, but I'm getting closer. Um, and you can do that by visiting uh, brianstriveintheater.com or run a search for Brian Strive in Theater in your favorite uh, web browser or search engine, excuse me, your search engine. Brian, thank you so very much. Uh, I thank enjoyed you. this conversation as I always do. And uh, fortunately, after we stop recording, we can continue it for a while. And All right. uh, I'm looking forward to the next edition of Brian Strive in Theater, The Many Faces of Hercules. Well, thank you very much. And I will see you next month in September. And thanks to everybody who tuned in. Uh, not live because we're not live right now, but on YouTube. Uh, everyone, until next time, this is us wishing you joyous journeys and amazing adventures. <laughs>